All right, uh, we're going to go ahead uh, and get started. Thank you all um, again for joining us tonight. Um, we're excited to see uh, many familiar faces here for the, the sixth lecture uh, in the series. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Dr. Michael Artime. I help coach debate here, um, and I'm an adjunct professor at Tacoma Community College. And I'm Mike Purdy. I'm a Seattle-based presidential historian. Um, I've got a blog on presidential history and a website with lots of cool resources about the 2016 election and uh, presidential history. You can go to that if you're interested. Um, all of the lectures, uh, most of you know, uh, are being recorded and they're all online. So if you've got friends who didn't see any of them and, or if you want to watch it again, uh, they're all online. So we talked um, last time that we're doing one extra bonus lecture. Today was supposed to be the last lecture, the sixth one. Um, but we're going to do one on June 7th because some interesting things might happen on June 7th. Um, we might find out a little bit more about uh, what's really going to happen, especially on the Republican uh, nomination. So we'll look at um, kind of the history of the whole uh, process. We'll do some analysis. Um, we will, at that point, a couple of sessions ago, somebody asked about who are possible vice presidential picks. And um, so we'll give our uh, best guesses on who some of those might be. And we'll look at uh, the primary uh, results coming in. So we've got it scheduled 7 to 9 on June 7th right here in this room. If you are interested, uh, you know, we're thinking about maybe doing some more lectures beyond the June 7th one. We haven't figured out exactly what that looks like. Uh, some of you last uh, time signed up with your email address so we could notify you of additional ones. If you didn't get on that list, there's some sign-in lists on the table out front here. Um, and you could do that, and Michael and I will let you know what those dates will be. We'll also try to get publicity out on it. Okay, presidential insults. Now, I'm not going to do anything about this election um, because the New York Times just published um, the complete list of 210 people, places, and things that Donald Trump has insulted on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can go there and you can take a look at that. But we're going to do a couple of things from history. Um, so his mind was not of the very first order. His judgment was slow in operation, being little aided by invention or imagination. His temper was naturally irritable. He was most tremendous in his wrath. In public, when called on for a sudden opinion, he was unready, short, and embarrassed. Who said that about who? I heard, did I hear Jackson? So, so um, you are right about the, um, I think you are right, about the Thomas Jefferson piece, but he said it about George Washington. <laughs> uh, George Washington. A lot of that could have applied to Adams because Adams had a temper. He was irritable and all that. Um, but Adams was a very quick mind. Um, Washington was kind of you know, slow and methodical and deliberate. So that's um, what Jefferson thought of uh, Washington. A squirrel head. <laughs> a squirrel head. I don't know what a squirrel head is, but it sounds like a good term. So that's Harry Truman on Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> a miserably perplexed man. A miserably perplexed man. That's Abraham Lincoln talking about James Polk. And we got a couple more. A little runt. So that's Theodore Roosevelt talking about Benjamin Harrison, who he did not like very much at all. Narrow intelligence. This one's going to surprise you. Franklin Pierce talking about Abraham Lincoln. Narrow intelligence. Old maid. <laughs> this is not a Trump one. This is James Polk talking about James Buchanan. Phony baloney. 
This is a more recent one, not this campaign, but more recent, and that is Richard Nixon talking about Bill Clinton. <laughs> Phony baloney. Okay. So, tonight we are going to um, talk about media, marketing, and the making of the president. So, campaigns are really more than just about policy positions and candidate credentials. They're about marketing and advertising, and there's a lot of different components that go into that. And so we're going to look at the ground game and slogans and logos and branding. Uh, we'll look at some historic media moments that have helped shape campaigns. Uh, look at newspaper endorsements and how are the candidates doing in terms of how many newspapers have endorsed them. Uh, we'll look at TV advertising. We'll actually watch a number of TV ads from the past. Um, look at the role of social media and talk about is the media biased. But before we get to all of that, Michael is going to tell us who's going to win the nominations. <laughs> well, I was going to do that, but then, you know, I'm from Illinois, so that Pierce insult really is, is bothering me too much. I'm not really thinking clearly, so I'll just go on with things uh, as planned. Um, so, in, in terms of the projections, we've been talking about these um, the last handful of, uh, of lectures, um, talking about where candidates um, should be expected to be uh, at this point um, in, in the process if they were to win the nomination. Right now, Donald Trump is at 97% of, of his target um, delegates. Uh, Cruz and Kasich are mathematically eliminated um, at this point, so he is the only one who has a chance of uh, getting to 1237, which is the number of delegates that you need to win uh, a majority in the Republican nomination contest. Uh, what you see is that uh, up here in the corner, that's where things stood uh, at our last uh, lecture. So Trump has improved um, on his, his target. Um, and, and if things continue the way that they are going right now, um, he is going to get the number of delegates uh, necessary to win the nomination. I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. Um, so you get, a, you ha I, like I had this lecture all planned, we were ready to go, and then things happen and um, you can't ignore the fact that they happened even if you want to. Um, so uh, Ted Cruz yesterday announced Carly Fiorina as his uh, vice presidential uh, nominee, so he is uh, mathematically eliminated, yet announcing who his <laughs> vice president is going to be, which is uh, an interesting choice. Uh, it is reminiscent in many ways of Ronald Reagan's um, selection of Robert Schweiker um, in 1976. Um, that was, um, you know, Reagan was, was losing in the delegate race to Gerald Ford, um, selected Schweiker, who was a more liberal candidate. This was going to be a, a unity ticket in many ways for the party. Um, ultimately, I think a lot of people look back on that historical moment and say that it was a failed, um, a failed strategic uh, effort. Um, Edwin Meese III, who was an advisor to Reagan, said this about that selection, said that the decision was made because we had kind of run out of the string of things to do in terms of what would generate news and keep the campaign in the news. And I think that there's a very clear corollary to what we're seeing um, happening um, with the, the Cruz campaign. I think that, you know, you saw Donald Trump win, um, win all five northeastern states that voted on Tuesday. Um, Donald Trump uh, was giving a, a foreign policy speech uh, on, on Wednesday, and so this was a way to generate some attention. Um, and, and it was announced in Indiana, which a lot of people see as really um, Ted Cruz's last stand if he is going to prevent Donald Trump from getting to that 1237 mark. Um, if we look on the Democratic side, I think that there are a number of signs that indicate that this is, uh, this is about over. Um, so Bernie Sanders fans can leave quietly and, and, and go to the back or go sob with each other. This is, it's, you know, it's, it's about the end and there's some definite signs um, that this is true. So uh, if you look at the Sanders campaigns, the Sanders campaign fired about 200 uh, employees or so. Um, additionally, they're changing their message, they're gearing their message toward um, trying to prepare for the, the platform fight. 
So they want to accumulate as many delegates as possible so when it comes time for there to be a convention that they can have as much say as possible in the platform of the, of the Democratic Party. Um, additionally, um, on the Clinton side, you can kind of see that they are wrapping things up by the fact that she has uh, pulled all ads in upcoming primary states. Um, so she's not going to be advertising in any of the upcoming primaries under the assumption that things are going to be sort of de-escalating um, here a little bit. So all signs at this point point to things sort of wrapping up um, on the Democratic side. Um, if we look at the calendar going forward, um, Indiana is a really important um, is a really important primary, um, particularly on the Republican side. So uh, that is, as I was saying before, uh, Cruz's sort of last stand um, in this election. Uh, he really needs to win um, in Indiana to stop Donald Trump from accumulating um, the necessary delegates to win the nomination. Right now, um, he is losing, um, according to the Real Clear Politics average in the state of Indiana. He's losing by about six percentage points. Um, if he was going to stop Donald Trump, even if he was to win in Indiana, he would have to perform well in California. If you look at the current polling in California, Donald Trump is about 17 points ahead of Ted Cruz. So even if Cruz wins in Indiana, that is certainly not a guarantee that he is going to win the nomination or prevent Donald Trump from getting to 1237. He would have to win Indiana and then do a lot of work before June 7th um, so that he could be more competitive um, in the state of California. Uh, in terms of where things are at uh, nationally, Donald Trump leads on the Republican side 43% um, to Ted Cruz's 30%. John Kasich is in third with 21%. Uh, on the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton has about 49.5%, um, and Bernie Sanders has about 45.8%. Uh, um, you know, the election looks a little bit closer than, than it actually is if you're looking at this national polling data. Really what you want to be paying attention to is how many delegates do these candidates have and how close are they to reaching the number of delegates necessary to get their, their party's nomination. So that's um, a, a description of where we're at right now. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Mike who's going to talk about um, strategy and, and not only how you develop strategy um, in terms of getting voters to come out to vote, but also how you market yourself uh, to the American people. Thank you, Michael. So strategy is very important um, in campaigning. It's, it's not just about, you know, who you are and what your policy positions are. So we want to talk about the term the ground game. So the ground game refers to a whole host of issues that uh, is your campaign organization. How organized are you? First one is um, analytics, uh, your data system. Um, after the Iowa primary, Donald Trump said, um, you know, I wish we had had a better ground game, but I didn't even know what ground game meant. Um, so he's figured it out. He has started to hire a number of experts. He's hired someone to help him with the uh, delegate count, uh, to help with the complex Republican uh, National Committee rules, the complex rules that each individual state has, and, and so there's strategy to this. So candidates do need to be very strategic. So you can look at a, a major failing in 1960. Uh, Richard Nixon pledged that he was going to campaign in all 50 states, and he did. Was that a good move? Probably not, because there's only a few states that really matter in terms of uh, the Electoral College. Um, so that was a strategic error on uh, Nixon's part. So your, your data system, if you're a candidate, uh, you know, you've got to have an ability to collect donations. So Bernie Sanders has done a very good job of this, you know, two and a half million individual donors um, who've given to his campaign, primarily online and very small donations generally. Uh, having the ability to, to monitor the polls, to do your own polling, uh, Trump has not had a pollster up to this point. So Trump has done some um, uh, not so wise things strategically in terms of campaign organization, but he's done some things very brilliantly in terms of um, branding, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, having a good website, having a tracking application, having an app. 
So you can go to Ted Cruz, uh, his website, you can download an app. What that app, is a mobile app, and it enables you to, um, you can sign into it using your Facebook account, gives the campaign access to all of your friends and information about you. Um, it also tracks your location, where you are. It enables the uh, campaign to kind of tie in what uh, your likely policy positions might be on certain things so when uh, they go doorbelling and talk to you they can kind of gear their message to what you're likely to be um, most interested in and um, it can also download uh, users um, email and phone contact list so from a privacy perspective if people really knew what was going on they might have some concerns about this but Cruz has a good app. Uh, some of the other candidates do as well, but um, that, uh, that hasn't helped Cruz enough. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why when we talk about um, branding and slogans. So having a good uh, database and analytics, which you're also working with the either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and their analytics is really important for getting out the vote. And if the Democrats get the vote out more, uh, Democrats tend to win because just the, how the demographics work on that. Now, one of the things uh, Cruz has done a very good job of uh, from an organizational standpoint is kind of outsmarting Trump on some of the uh, individual states. So, for instance, in Colorado, uh, which doesn't have a primary or a caucus, he was able to get delegates loyal to him uh, uh, selected to go to the National Convention. So the ground game also consists of managing volunteers, having volunteers to man phone banks, events, take people to the, the, the polling booth, uh, putting up yard signs, um, having experienced campaign advisors, which again Trump has not had up to this point. He's just begun doing that uh, because the rules of the game are complex. And it's important to uh, be able to manage the media. Um, now, Trump has gotten a lot of uh, free media publicity. And we're going to talk in a little bit about the role of social media as well. So slogans, logos, and branding. So slogans are sometimes about the candidate. Sometimes they're about the candidate's opposition. So you, you try to brand your opponent. Um, negatively. Sometimes slogans are about the country, they're about America. Sometimes they're about hope and the future. And so we're going to look at some um, historical examples as well as kind of analyze what the current field looks like. So going back to the 1840 election, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Notice the rhyming, okay? So William Henry Harrison, the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 against Native Americans, um, is running based on being a, a famous general. Uh, Tyler, John Tyler, is his vice presidential running mate. So that was their slogan. 1916, Woodrow Wilson is running for a second term in office. And the, the slogan was, he has kept us out of war. He kept us out of the Great War, what we know as World War I. Wilson was uh, inaugurated for his second term on March 2nd, uh, March 4th, uh, 1917. And less than two months later, on April 2nd, 1917, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. So his slogan kind of uh, lasted about a month. <laughs> 1956, Dwight Eisenhower is running for re-election. Notice a couple of things about this. It's talking about the party. It's talking about the candidate. It's got his picture. And it's got a slogan, peace, prosperity, and progress. Um, notice the alliteration there. These are all good, promising things. Peace at home, prosperity here, and making progress. Um, so he kind of combines all of those together. 1964, Lyndon Johnson had a colossal ego. <laughs> and that's reflected in his campaign slogan, all the way with LBJ. It's not about the country. It's about him. Okay, and it's rhyming as well. 1968, Richard Nixon 
again, not so much about the country other than Nixon's the one who can do a good job, but it's the focus is on Nixon as a person, um, more so than any kind of uh, message about hope or the future or some patriotic message is focusing on the candidate. 1980, Ronald Reagan. Gee, where did this come from? Yeah. <laughs> let's make America great again. So Donald Trump has obviously just dropped off the let's. Uh, so again, a, a hope-inspired message, a patriotic message. Um, and then in 1984, when he's running for re-election, a TV advertisement, uh, it's morning again in America, where he recounts all the good things that have happened in the last four years. It's kind of a warm and fuzzy message. Um, and then in 2008, um, Barack Obama. And, and notice a couple of things about this. It's very simple. It's three words. Yes, we can. It's about we. It's not about him. It's a message of hope. Okay? Very effective uh, from a slogan perspective. So I want to look at the uh, candidates that are still in the race now, and uh, primarily from the perspective of their website and what those websites show their slogan is. Now, some of these candidates have multiple slogans, which I think is problematic, and we'll talk about that. So Donald Trump, make America great again. Very simple. Um, it's inspiring hope, even though the message that he may uh, speak isn't necessarily hope-based, it's more fear-based. Um, America is in big letters. Uh, you've got you know, five elegant stars on the top and the bottom of it. The thing about Trump is that is his slogan. If, if we talked about that, you know, what's Trump's slogan? We, could, we all would know that. I'm not sure that's true about the other candidates that we know what their slogan is, or maybe there's multiple slogans. Ted Cruz, a couple observations from his website. So join the movement of courageous conservatives. So this is very ideological. It's you only join if you're a conservative, and you have to be a courageous conservative to do it. Um, now, interestingly, Cruz has a bunch of other messages out there. So when he announced the other day that Carly Fiorina would be his vice presidential pick, uh, you saw signs that said, um, Jobs, freedom, and security. Okay, so is that his logo? Or is it courageous conservatives? Or is it um, reigniting the promise of America, which you see other places? Or is it trust Ted? So there's multiple messages out there that Cruz is doing. So again, this is where Trump is a genius from a marketing perspective. He's focused on one message. He's said that time and time again. I, I think it's also interesting that Cruz, um, we don't see the front of his face. We see the back or a side view of it. Uh, he's been criticized about his face and his smile. Uh, one commentator said that he is about as telegenic as an undertaker. <laughs> and, and so maybe that's why we don't see his face. I think it's also interesting that Cruz has to say that it is a movement. Join the movement. So, so generally when we think about movements, we think of grassroots things that just kind of happen. But he has to try to define it. Hey, this is a movement. Um, which is what John Kasich has to say too. Join the movement. Um, Kasich. So this is from his website. Um, I didn't know what his uh, slogan was. Um, I've not seen a positive vision for America used elsewhere. I, I don't know that he has anything else. But a positive vision for America. So it's a nice slogan. It's not very catchy. It's got too many syllables in it, way too complex. Um, and so it, it's a little bit um, problematic. You know, help grow our momentum. Well, he definitely needs that because um, <laughs> he doesn't have that at this point. So Kasich has been very weak from a messaging perspective and, and saying the same thing so that people would know what he believes. 
Hillary Clinton, you could say her, her slogan is fighting for us or Hillary for America, which you also see. Um, but fighting for us, I think you see most. And the interesting thing about that is, so it does have us included, but it's fighting. So you, you're ready for a fight. And, and so the, Bill and Hillary Clinton throughout their careers have uh, viewed themselves as fighters. Um, and so th this is coming out here. So it's... It's that she will be a fighter, so it's about her. It's not so much about us, other than that she'll fight for us. Kind of similar to, you know, attitudes that Richard Nixon had. He, he saw life as a big fight, okay? Uh, politics is a big fight. Bernie Sanders, a future to believe in, although sometimes you see, you know, feel the burn. Um, but, but I think you see mainly a future to believe in. I think it's interesting that... Um, this is it's about the future, it's about hope, um, and the use of the word believe is interesting because um, it has some faith-based connotations, belief, but it's coming from probably the least religious candidate running right now. Uh, Sanders is a secular Jew. Uh, the only person who would probably compete with him for being non-religious would be Trump. So let's talk a little bit about negative campaigning. So how you brand your opponent with something that sticks. So before we had Donald Trump saying lying Ted or uh, you know uh, little Marco or crooked Hillary, we've got examples from the past of uh, people trying to brand their opponent. So if we go back to 1884, any guesses who these guys are? Not Taft. Cleveland. Cleveland. Grover Cleveland on the right and James Blaine on the left. So um, James Blaine had some problems. He had some ethical issues, um, serious ethical issues and lots of charges of bribery and things like that. So the, um, the taunt against Blaine was... Blaine Blaine, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. <laughs> That's what the Democrats used against Blaine. Not to be outdone, the Republicans found out that Grover Cleveland had fathered an illegitimate child. And when asked, uh, when Cleveland's campaign staffers came to him with that, they said, what should we do? He said, tell the truth. But the Republicans took that and they said, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? <laughs> and that was the Republican taunt against Cleveland. But Cleveland turned it around and completed that sentence of Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, a nasty campaign. In 1944, Thomas Dewey was running for president. And, um, you know, before we had um, unfiltered language today of Donald Trump, who, you know, just anything comes out of his mouth, in a, for, in a bygone era, that was, uh, belonged to Alice Roosevelt, the oldest daughter of Theodore Roosevelt. And she was a big Washington socialite, but she kind of said whatever came to her mouth. So at the um, uh, Republican convention, somebody mentioned to her that um, Thomas Dewey looked like the little man on the wedding cake. And Alice Roosevelt spread that everywhere. Um, and, and this was a way to say, you know, Dewey doesn't look very presidential, you know, this little thin um, mustache and, and everything. And that became how Dewey was characterized, is the little man on the wedding cake. <laughs> Didn't help his presidential prospects at all. So let's talk about logos a little bit. So currently, we've got um, the three Republicans. So notice Trump's logo. It's got his name, and it's got his slogan all together. It's very simple. It's very elegant. Um, Ted Cruz just has his name. 
first and last name, 2016, and it's got, you know, some red, white, and blue. That's supposed to be a flame, I think, because one of his uh, slogans is, you know, reigniting the promise of America, so this is a flame. And then John Kasich, just his name. Um, so if we take a look at the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton is the only candidate who doesn't have either her first or her last name in, this, uh, in her logo. Um, it's just got this, you know, stylized H with a right pointing red arrow. Um, you know, she moving away from the left to, to the right. Uh, you know, don't know what that means. Um, but it's a very corporate feel to it. Um, it's not very personalized. It doesn't have anything about her slogan um, or anything like that in it. So it's kind of bland. Um, Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, you know, Bernie. You know, so, so we, we've got this, you know, 74-year-old socialist who is running for president, and he's known by millions as Bernie. And so he's capitalizing on that in his logo. And then all of the websites of all the candidates, you can buy lots of stuff um, in, in, from their stores or online stores. Uh, Donald Trump has spent you know, more than $650,000 on hats. Make America great again. That's more than he has spent on strategic consulting. Um, so that's where he's put the money. I mean, he has run a very unorthodox campaign, but I think because of his genius in branding and uh, because he is a charismatic figure, um, he has struck a chord with many people. But you can also go to Hillary Clinton's website and you can buy a uh, cell phone case. Um, you can buy a dog shirt with Kasich on it for your dog or a feel the burn mug or a, uh, a grilling spatula uh, with, with Cruz's uh, name in 2016 on it. And plenty of other things to, to spend your money on. But these are all part of how you get the message across. Um, but, but, but again, if you go back, you look at Trump, the slogan is everywhere. It's on the website, it's on the hat, it's on the logo. It's, it's very simple and, and gets it across. So the media is very significant in shaping or breaking campaigns. And uh, the, the, the media used to uh, kind of give a free pass to candidates and to presidents. So for instance, Franklin Roosevelt uh, did not permit the media to photograph him in a wheelchair. Can you imagine something like that today? Um, John F. Kennedy's affairs were off limits to the media, even though they knew about it. Um, so things have changed a lot, and they, they, there's plenty of examples we could use, but I'm going to just go over a couple of them. So who do we have on the left here? George McGovern. So in 1972, running for president, he um, selects Thomas Eagleton as his vice president, Missouri Senator Thomas Eagleton. And two weeks after the Republican convention, Eagleton discloses that he has experienced depression and he's been treated with electroshock therapy. He's been hospitalized in the past because of depression. So this causes a big uproar and McGovern says, I'm 100% behind Tom Eagleton and I have no intention of dropping him from the ticket. Except for six days later, that's what he did. <laughs> So this was a huge issue um, in 1972. 1987, Gary Hart is running for president. There's rumors about his womanizing. And Hart says that those uh, candidates who criticize him for being a womanizer were not going to win that way because you don't get to the top by tearing someone else down. What an innocent thought. <laughs> You know, we're, we're in a different world right now. And, and then, of course, he, uh, Hart issues the challenge to reporters and says, follow me around. I don't care. I'm serious. If anybody wants to put a tail on me, go ahead. They'll be very bored. 
Well, the Miami Herald was not bored when they staked out his townhouse and saw Donna Rice going in one night and not leaving until the next morning, and that was the end of Gary Hart's campaign. Or more recently, in 2012, Mitt Romney, with the secret recording of Romney talking about the 47% of Americans who don't pay taxes, who are freeloaders, and who he can never convince them to take personal responsi responsibility and care for their lives. And um, so this became a big issue that hurt Romney a lot uh, because it kind of confirmed for many people what they already thought about him. So the media can have uh, very significant um, impacts on that. So newspapers are part of the media. Newspapers are obviously not doing as well uh, today as they have in the past, but nevertheless, newspaper endorsements do sway many people. So I think it's really interesting to look at the major newspaper endorsements of the uh, candidates still in the race. Donald Trump has exactly two. Ted Cruz has three. Kasich, who is way behind in the polls and in the delegate count, has 44, including the New York Times, which Trump would say is a failing newspaper. Um, Hillary Clinton tops it, 57, and Bernie Sanders has 10. So it's just another way to look at you know, the role of the media in helping to shape um, elections. The other thing that really helps shape elections, uh, maybe even more than newspapers, is television advertising. Because television advertising gets that kind of a visceral response, depending on how the candidate has put together the uh, campaign ad. And Michael is going to walk us through uh, some examples of some TV ads from the past and some analysis. Thanks, Mike. Um, Mike was talking about merchandise, and I would encourage all of you, uh, when you get a chance, to look at the Ted Cruz Outlaw poster. I'm not going to show it here tonight, but do yourself a favor. Treat yourself tonight. Go online and, and check that out. Uh, I'm going to take you through a brief uh, history of, of television advertising um, in, in the United States, particularly uh, negative uh, television advertising as it relates to the presidential election. The first ad... Um, that we'll look at is from 1964. This ad was run um, by the Johnson campaign, so it was Johnson versus Goldwater. This ad only aired one time, um, but it was uh, it became famous because it was talked about in lots of different circles. People were talking about this with each other. It was talked about on the news, and so they only had to spend the money to air it one time for it to become one of the most famous um, ads of all time. Um, in this ad, what you see is Johnson's critique of the Goldwater campaign. Goldwater had threatened to use um, tactical nuclear weapons or tactical atomic weapons um, in North Vietnam to disrupt um, supply lines, to, um, to stop the transport of materials um, from places like China. Um, and so uh, it, it became sort of um, a, a critique of Goldwater that he was... Uh, trigger happy, that he wasn't somebody that you would want to give uh, the button to. Um, and so you'll see that uh, played out here in this message. Should be a critique of the education system. So. I mean, I don't know about you, but that would have sold my vote, for sure. I don't want to die. Yeah, so. 
Um, the next ad that we'll look at is from is from 1984. It's the famous Bear in the Woods ad. I think it should win an award for being the most vague ad in presidential um, election history. But um, essentially, the bear is supposed to represent um, communism. This was the election where Reagan um, was against uh, Mondale. Reagan had a huge lead at the time that this ad um, aired, so it's not a direct uh, negative attack against Mondale, but it is positioning um, Reagan as the best person to sort of stand up against communism. There is a bear in the woods. For some people, the bear is easy to see. Others don't see it at all. Some people say the bear is tame. Others say it's vicious and dangerous. Since no one can really be sure who's right, isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? If there is a bear. If there's a bear, not. <laughs> You'd want to be strong if there was a bear. That guy in the woods obviously was going to beat up the bear. If you've seen like The Revenant, you know how that kind of turns out. It's not, not good. Um, this next ad is from is from 1988. Um, this is um, considered perhaps. You know, there's some people that argue that that uh, if you take the the um, Daisy Girl ad out of consideration, that this would be the most effective ad of all time. There's there's some debate about that, but it certainly was um, an influential ad. The the Willie Horton ad. This ad was run. Um, by actually an outside group. It wasn't run by the George H.W. Bush campaign. Um, it was run by the National Security Political Action Committee. Um, they cleared the ad first with television stations, and then they added the mugshot later. Um, the argument um, against this ad was the addition of the mugshot was designed to sort of stoke racial resentment in the United States. It was designed to, um, to create fear um, of, of, of black Americans. And so this ad came under um, a lot of criticism. The Bush campaign um, tried to distance themselves from the ad. Later on, they released a different version of this ad. So the ad is about um, the prison furlough program, which allowed Willie Horton to, to leave. He committed more crimes when he, was, um, when he was outside of prison. This was in Massachusetts, where uh, Michael Dukakis was governor. Um, later on, um, the, the Bush campaign ran, ran an ad that was called the revolving door ad, and it showed essentially a revolving door in the front of the prison where uh, menacing looking people were leaving the prison and, um, you know, I guess going out and committing a whole host of, of, new, of new crimes. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. Vote for Dukakis. Everybody gets a pass out of prison. So, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly scary. And, and feeding into um, an argument that Dukakis was, was weak um, on crime and that you should vote for Bush as somebody who is, is for law and order. This next ad is from, uh, is from 2004. This is in the race between John Kerry and George W. Bush. This ad was run by the George W. Bush campaign. Um, essentially, this ad is making two arguments. It's making an argument which has been made in political campaigns for as long as we've had political campaigns, <laughs> that uh, John Kerry is a flip-flopper that he takes different positions on the same issue. And also, it's tied to John Kerry's love of doing sort of elitist outdoor activities like sailing, that he is somebody who is out of touch from the, the common person. I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. In which direction would John Kerry lead? Kerry voted for the Iraq War, opposed it, supported it, and now opposes it again. He bragged about voting for the $87 billion to support our troops before he voted against it. 
He voted for education reform and now opposes it. He claims he's against increasing Medicare premiums, but voted five times to do so. John Kerry, whichever way the wind blows. Uh, the next ad that we will look at is from 2008. This is from the Democratic primary campaign. This ad was run by Hillary Clinton against, um, against President Obama. Um, the ad was run at a time when, um, when the economy was becoming the main focus um, in the election. And the argument that the Clinton campaign wanted to make was that we should return our focus to foreign policy questions um, because she was seen as, as more capable of handling uh, foreign policy issues. She was the person that you wanted in control if our country was to face some sort of international crisis. Um, interestingly, one of the uh, one of the girls who is depicted in this ad as potentially being saved by Hillary Clinton is Casey Knowles, who um, is uh, someone that grew up here in Washington. She went to high school in in Bonnie Lake, and she didn't realize that she was in this ad when she found out she declared her support for Obama. So it was an interesting connection to the the state of Washington. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. But there's a phone in the White House and it's ringing. Something's happening in the world. Your vote will decide who answers that call. Whether it's someone who already knows the world's leaders, knows the military, someone tested and ready to lead in a dangerous world. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. Who do you want answering the phone? I'm Hillary Clinton and I approve this message. These ads, you'll notice a theme in that a lot of them, you know, kind of make you afraid. <laughs> We're going to get bombed. There's a crisis that's occurred. You know, they're, uh, you know, especially when you're talking about the more experienced candidate, they want to say that experience is a reason why you should support somebody who is most capable of handling, um, who's capable of handling some of these disastrous situations. Um, this, uh, returning to this election, um, this is um, an ad that was released by the Cruz campaign um, on February 15th um, in advance of the South Carolina primary. Um, it is an attempt to make the argument that Donald Trump is not conservative enough to represent um, the Republican Party in the general election. <coughs> I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. I'm very capable of changing to anything I want to change to. That's for sure. With President Trump, damn partial of the world. And pro choice in every respect. But you would not ban it. No. And Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood serves a good function. And Hillary Clinton. And I think she does a good job. And I like her. South Carolina cannot trust Donald Trump. I'm very capable of changing to anything I want to change to. Don't give him that chance. <laughs> and uh, this ad is, is uh, the newest ad that we'll look at. This ad was run by the, the Bernie Sanders campaign um, in New York. Um, it, it is making the argument that he has made throughout the election cycle that Hillary Clinton is tied to, to Wall Street <laughs> interests. Um, what I think is interesting about this ad is that it makes that argument without ever using her name. And so um, it, is, it is very much making that argument, but it doesn't reference Clinton specifically. The Wall Street banks shower Washington politicians with campaign contributions and speaking fees. And what do they get for it? A rigged economy, tax breaks, and bailouts, all held in place by a corrupt campaign finance system. And while Washington politicians are paid over $200,000 an hour for speeches, they oppose raising the living wage to $15 an hour. $200,000 an hour for them, but not even 15 bucks an hour for all Americans. Enough is enough. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. Okay. And I, I couldn't resist, so I'm going to show a couple of my favorite ads of all time. I don't really tie into this theme as much as um, this is just something that I couldn't help myself from, from doing. So this is an ad um, that was created by um, Stephen Colbert's Super PAC. Um, it was uh, in 2012, uh, his Super PAC was Americans for a Better Tomorrow Tomorrow. Um, and it was an act of satire, sort of. Um, 
critiquing the campaign finance system. So he creates a super PAC. It engages in a lot of the same activities that super PACs do as a way of sort of exposing um, the way that the system doesn't work. Um, and I think that it's, it's really smart <coughs> comedy, um, and it produces, uh, I think, one of the funniest ads that, that I have personally ever seen. Corporations, America's greatest institution. They built this country one job at a time. Mitt Romney says he's for corporations. Corporations are people, my friend. <laughs> but Mitt Romney has a secret. As head of Bain Capital, he bought companies, carved them up, and got rid of what he couldn't use. Mitt <laughs> <laughs> Romney really believes... Corporations are people, my friend. <laughs> and Mitt Romney is a serial. <laughs> Mitt the Ripper. <laughs> if you believe corporations are people, do your duty and protect them. On Saturday, January 21st, stop Mitt the Ripper before he kills again. Americans for Better Tomorrow Tomorrow are responsible for the content of this advertising. <laughs> Terrifying. And uh, this next ad is actually one that was uh, released by the, the most recent uh, vice presidential nominee. So this is an ad that was run by Carly Fiorina in California when she was running in a, uh, a Senate Republican uh, primary. She was running against Tom Campbell um, for the opportunity um, in a general election to go against Barbara Boxer for the Senate seat. Um, in California. And so uh, this ad got a lot of notoriety. Um, Tom, uh, Time Magazine's uh, Michael Scherer said that you should watch uh, this ad by first uh, turning on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Um, and I think that you'll see what he means by that when we watch this. Tom Campbell. Is he what he tells us? Or is he what he's become over the years? A F C I N O. Fiscal conservative in name only. A wolf in sheep's clothing. A man who literally helped put the state of California on the path to bankruptcy and higher taxes. Fiscal conservative. Or just another same old tale of tax and spend. Authored by a career politician who helped guide us into this fiscal mess in the first place. <laughs> So it became famous. It's known as the demon sheep ad. Um, <laughs> um, but ultimately, the point of all of this is, um, you know, negative campaigns are a tool that is used um, that is used by by presidential candidates um, to to help win elections. And so. Uh, one thing that uh, that seems to be the case is they, they seem to work. Campaigns aren't just filled with terrible people who like to say mean things about their opponent. They do these things because they are effective um, to some extent. Um, John Gear uh, writes, uh, wrote a book, he's a political scientist, wrote a book called In Defense of Negativity. Um, and he argues that negative campaign ads are great because they focus on substantive issues. So they would look, he would look at an ad like the, the John Kerry ad, and he would say, that ad brings up a number of different substantive differences between George W. Bush and John Kerry. And he argues the alternative to negative ads is to have positive ads where we're focusing just on candidate characteristics. Like, oh, isn't it nice that they're having dinner with their family? And he argues that negative ads at least uh, raise our awareness about issues which are relevant um, to who is or is not going to win the election. Um, Ansel Abir Iyengar and some other political scientists got together. They wrote a pretty influential article called Does Attack Advertising Demobilize the Electorate? And they say, yes, it does. Um, so so they, they critique negative advertising, and they say that negative advertising causes people to disengage from the political system, that we don't like it. Um, to hear this sort of tone um, in our political debates. And as a consequence, they say that negative ads um, tend to decrease voter turnout by about 5%. And so that's a, that's a substantive difference. That, that difference can, um, can change the outcome of, of elections. And, um, and, and that's problematic. Um, and so these are just a couple different perspectives 
um, on, on whether negative advertising is a good thing or a bad thing um, in, in political campaigns. Um, we're next going to, to turn to a new way in which candidates try to reach, uh, reach voters, reach their supporters, and that is through the use of social media, and Mike's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, Michael. And of course, social media is all positive, right? I mean, there's no negativity there. Well, I, I want to look at Twitter in particular. Um, which has been used, it's, it's kind of your new way to call a press conference. It's the way to insult your opponent um, and, and to get that message out to millions of people very quickly. And, and nobody has made better use of Twitter than Donald Trump. Um, he has probably used Twitter more effectively than any other candidate. And I think we're just, we're really seeing in this election cycle the, the rise of Twitter as an effective tool. So some quotes from Trump about Twitter. He, he talks about his foes. He says, I have more power than they do. So he can say whatever he wants and he gets that out. He says, I can let people know that they were a fraud. I can let people know that they have no talent, that they didn't know what they're doing. You have a voice. So he doesn't have to rely upon mainstream media. He can get it out through social media. And then he talks about the, the value of deleting tweets. Um, he says, once one of the things I do find is that when you delete it, it becomes a bigger story than having it. And so he's, you know, puts something inflammatory out there and then pulls it back, but people have seen it, and so that becomes a big story. So let's just look at how the candidates compare in their use of Twitter. So um, Donald Trump has tweeted 31.7 thousand tweets. He's got 7.7 .7 million followers. Uh, Clinton has, you know, a little over 6 million followers. Sanders, a little over 2 million. Cruz, a little over 1 million. And Kasich, 304,000. Um, and, and so you look at the, um, the numbers of how many they have t tweets they have put out there. So Cruz is the only one who comes halfway close, and he's over a million. But all the others are just in the, the thousands. So I actually, on my presidential history, I have a Twitter account. It's Prez, P-R-E-S, Prez History. And I'm catching up to Hillary Clinton on the number of tweets. You know, I have over 4,000, and she's got just 5,200. So it is a new tool, and it is something that um, I think candidates have to pay attention to um, because things are changing. So I would suggest that um, Twitter in particular, is really the 21st century version of a duel. So in the 1700s and the 1800s, if you insulted somebody or you had some kind of a gripe with somebody, you challenged them to a duel and a shootout. So we remember famously that um, Alexander Hamilton um, you know, insulted Aaron Burr. Hamilton was the Treasury Secretary. Burr was the Vice President. Um, Burr challenged him to a duel, and of course, uh, Hamilton was killed. So, you know, if they had had Twitter, you know, ha Hamilton could have said, you know, Aaron Burr is a profligate, a voluptuary in the extreme, someone, you know, uh, dealing with uh, um, sensual things, uh, lots of um, financial things, you know, spending lots. And, and Burr might have responded, you know, that Hamilton should pol apologize for insulting me and swaying the House to vote for Jefferson instead of me for president. So you remember in 1800, they both tied with 73 electoral votes, and uh, Hamilton, behind the scenes, helped to sway the election to Jefferson. So they, there was a lot of bad blood between these two men, and it resulted in a death. Um, you know, likewise, we might speculate and say, well, if we didn't have Twitter, would we have dueling? Would we have, you know, Donald Cruz or, 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 or Donald Trump uh, shooting uh, Ted Cruz in a, du in a duel? <laughs> this is my attempt at Photoshop here, you know. <laughs> so um, that's the new media. Social media, Twitter in particular, has been really significant. 
Um, but we go back to this big question of is the media, um, are they biased in any way? And Michael's going to walk us through a little bit of that. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so first, um, you know, uh, I'll turn our attention back to, uh, in answering this question, turn our attention back to 2008 um, in the election between Obama and McCain. Um, this is in the later stages of the campaign in September and October. Um, and what you see is that the coverage of McCain was more negative um, than it was for Obama. So Obama had more positive coverage um, less negative coverage um, in the later stages of the campaign. That is also true um, in 2012 um, with Obama versus Romney. So what you can see this blue area here, Obama had more positive coverage in the media and Obama had less negative coverage um, in the media. However, I, I don't necessarily think that that is because there's some sort of vast uh, liberal conspiracy against um, Republican candidates, I think that it very much has to do with um, the direction of the race um, at that time. So um, there are a couple different types of stories that Pew, uh, Pew divides out here. They, they say that there are horse race stories and there are non-horse race stories. So for something to be a horse race story, what you're looking for is some sort of discussion of the strategy of the campaign. Who's winning? Who's losing? How can the person who's winning stumble and fall behind? How can the person who's behind do something to catch up? How much money has this person raised versus this person? Sort of the strategic aspects of the campaign that aren't substantive. And what they find is that the news stories were not that different um, when they weren't dealing with horse race discussions. Um, so Obama clearly doing better in horse race campaign stories. So 28% of the stories are positive about Obama um, with regard to uh, horse race stories, only 29% negative. Romney, 15% positive on horse race stories, 45% negative. Which makes sense. He's not doing very well um, in the campaign at that time. or not doing as well um, as Obama is doing. And what you see in non-horse race stories is that it's about even there, and it's dead even in terms of negative stories. Okay. Um, where I would say there is a, a big change in the way that the media um, covers uh, political campaigns is in, um, is in the growth of social media uh, that Mike was talking about just a moment ago. And I think the, the, what you're seeing is not a bias toward um, one party or another, what I think that you're seeing is a bias toward um, hostility. And so you'll look at uh, the uh, mainstream news is here. This is the type of coverage that each of those candidates is receiving. What you'll see is that in terms of negative coverage, Obama's coverage on Twitter is 15% higher than it is in the mainstream media. Romney's coverage on Twitter is 20% more negative than in the mainstream media. On Facebook, Obama's coverage is 23% more negative. Romney's is 24% more negative. In blogs, Obama's coverage is 14% more negative than in the mainstream media, and Romney's is 8% uh, more hostile or more negative um, than in the mainstream media. So these social media tools are not necessarily biased in the direction of Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives. Um, what they are biased toward is, is perhaps a sensationalism or a negativity, which then extends to the way that we evaluate political leaders, institutions, and issues. Now, if you want to find bias sources of information. You, you can. So that's, that's easy enough. So on MSNBC, in the later stages of the campaign, only 3% of the stories about Romney were positive. 71% were negative. The rest were neutral. Um, on Fox uh, News, uh, coverage of Obama was only 6% positive. 46% uh, were negative, and the rest were, were neutral. And so if you are really excited about paying attention to sources that agree with your existing perspective, then there are uh, plenty of opportunities to seek out uh, those sources of information. Uh, 
Another way in which the media is important in this uh, particular election, I don't buy the argument, um, for example, and, and you hear this a lot, that the media has been sort of soft on Trump or hasn't critiqued Trump enough. Um, I, I just don't think that's true. I think that every negative thing that you could say about Trump has been said somewhere in, in the news. Um, they, they do present, uh, they do present negative portrayals of Trump. But what, what has happened is that he has gotten much more coverage than everyone else. A lot of that coverage has been negative, but he has certainly been on the news more than um, any other candidate during this election cycle. Um, there's a, a source known as MediaQuant, and they track, they're a firm that tracks um, this thing known as earned media. This is how much time you're on television and how much you would pay, how much you would have to pay to be on television that often. Um, and Trump got, uh, in February alone, um, had over uh, $400 million worth of earned media. Um, the next closest is uh, Clinton and Cruz, who were sort of neck and neck at just under $200 million worth of free media. Um, in this election cycle, Donald Trump has about $2 billion worth of free media. The next closest is Hillary Clinton with, I think, $756 million in free media. And so I don't think that it's true that the media has been soft on Trump, but I do think what is true is that they have certainly talked about him more than they have talked about anyone else. Um, this is an analysis that was done by Nate Silver, who we've talked about in here before uh, on his website, 538.com. Um, he used the site Mimi Random, which uses an algorithm to see which stories are uh, leading political coverage um, on the internet. And um, all of these orange days are days in which Trump was leading the news. Um, and this is February and March. And so what you can see here, particularly in March, it's essentially every day. So I think that's where the real issue, at least in this election cycle, exists with the media. Yeah, uh, sure. Now, Donald Trump is willing to go on any network, any cable news channel. Isn't that a big factor in the sure. candidates have shied away from certain um, programs or networks? Yeah, yeah. So certainly you cannot, certainly this is not just um, an issue with the media. It's also an issue with other campaigns who are perhaps not willing to spend as much time as possible um, in front of the camera. But a lot of this is coverage that exists um, when Trump is not appearing um, on these shows or is not directly doing interviews. It's, it's analysis of, of his campaign, um, for example. But certainly some of it is related to the way in which he has made himself accessible to the media. The other thing that I think is important to talk about in this election cycle is, is gender. And I think that this is um, perhaps a, a forgotten component of this election. It is a big deal that we could perhaps um, elect our first female president. We don't really talk about that very much, but that's an important part of, of what's happening during this election cycle. And it's important um, to understand that the ways in which women are depicted in the media are still problematic. There are still differences in the ways that we talk about female candidates versus the way that we talk about male candidates. And I think that it's important to, to analyze that. The New York Times in June of 2008, after Hillary Clinton dropped out of the election, um, noted a number of different instances in which um, they said that there was sexist coverage of, of Hillary Clinton. Chris Matthews said that Hillary Clinton was a she-devil uh, Mike Barnacle on MSNBC said Clinton was looking like everyone's first wife standing outside a probate court. Uh, Tucker Carlson on MSNBC said when she comes on television, I voluntarily cross my legs. Uh, the New York Times said uh, they wrote about her cackle um, when talking about her voice, and the Washington Post wrote about her cleavage. So certainly in 2008, we were hearing... Um, we were hearing discussions uh, that, that were clearly that were clearly sexist. If you remember back to the um, the beginning of this election cycle, um, when it was announced that Hillary Clinton had become a, a grandma, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, what is that going to mean for her 
uh, her campaign. And we would never ask that of, uh, of a male candidate. It's totally irrelevant whether they have you know, one grandchild or 30 grandchildren. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a difference when we're trying to evaluate whether a man would run or not run. This is not limited just to the way that um, we, uh, we talk about uh, liberal candidates, but the Washington Post had an article in 2011 which very much engaged in sexist coverage of, of Sarah Palin. Um, based on this Newsweek cover, this is an article written by Jonathan Capehart who says, as celebrity glamour shots go, uh, Sarah Palin's cover photo on this week's Newsweek is dang good. The best-selling author and reality TV star looks young and vibrant, her devil-may-care continents aided and abetted by the wind conspicuously blowing hair back. And while her outfit might be laid back, there's no doubt she's in total control. But when Palin's cover shot is viewed through the prism of presidential politics, it's a dud. So, I mean, I think that, you know, clearly, clearly problematic. We are talking about the appearance, the dress of women in a way, uh, still to this day, in politics that we would not, uh, we wouldn't use that way, uh, that, that method to analyze uh, male candidates. This is a study that was released um, earlier this year. Um, this is uh, by Farley Dickinson's University, um, and um, what I want you to pay attention to is this, uh, this center category here. Um, so what they did was they, they did an experiment where they, uh, they had two groups of men, in this case, here. Um, one group of men was just asked, um, you know, do you, support, uh, do you support Hillary Clinton or do you support Donald Trump? Um, that is this category here. So overwhelmingly supported Hillary Clinton. It was 49 to 33%. They took a very similar group of men, and then before asking them who they supported, they asked them the question, how would you feel if your spouse made more money than you? And this is the result. So the results were 50 to 42 in favor of Trump. That's a, a huge 24 point swing. When actually confronted with the idea that women would be in charge, Right, or they would be more in charge than them. Men had a reaction to that, a pretty substantial reaction. And I think that that's, that's pretty clear evidence that, that this is not something that is, that is over um, in American politics and something that we have to think critically about. One way that we, um, that we can, you know, at least on a small scale, perhaps change, um, change this is through the way that we talk about the office of the presidency. So these are a couple of quotes. Um, the first duty of the next president of the United States is to fix the mess at the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's his first responsibility. That's a statement from Jeb Bush. Ted Cruz said, we need a president who knows what he believes in, is willing to say it on day one, not at the end of his term. Um, a couple of political scientists, Fox and Lawless, they said that one of the major barriers um, for women um, gaining political office in the United States is the fact that um, there's a lack of confidence. That because of uh, media depictions of women, because of the way that we talk about women, because we don't ask women to run for office, they often have lower evaluations of their own potential as candidates than men. One of the ways that we can change that is by changing even the pronouns that we use to talk about the presidency. If we were to say, if we were to describe the presidency in female pronouns, perhaps that would make the presidency something that seemed accessible to those women who don't believe that that is an office that is open to them. And so that is one small thing that we do, we can do. We can change the language that we use. We can send the signal to those around us that it is an option. Um, for women um, to, to achieve political office. And, um, and I think that's incredibly important and a part of this election that we haven't talked about very much. Um, so tonight we've talked about uh, a lot of different things. We've talked about strategy, marketing, um, advertising, um, the, the state of the media. And we hope that you can join us on uh, June 7th um, to do a, a, a discussion of a few different things and then uh, turn our attention to the election results that night. But we're going to answer some questions here for the next 15 minutes or so. Questions, yes. Do you 
So the question relates to uh, should uh, Time Warner news media, which um, is a big contributor to the Clinton campaign, should they have to disclose that? Um, Michael, you're the finance I'm in favor guy. of as much disclosure as possible. Um, and I, I think that if they're giving money directly to the campaign, they would have to disclose that um, now. So uh, I think a lot of the times what we're talking, so there's actually a lot of information about, now, now there is some issues with things like dark money, and I talked about that when I talked about fundraising in here a while back. But in terms of fundraising that goes directly to campaigns or to super PACs, for example, that information exists. The, the problem is that we don't often look at it, and we don't often um, hold candidates, hold politicians accountable for what we find. And so, so it exists there. Um, it's just a matter of, of getting people to pay attention to it. Um, but you can look at, um, I think there's uh, Open Secrets is one of the sites where you can find um, information about who donates um, to who. And I think there are some others as well that do a pretty good job of um, showing where candidates get their money from. Yes, in the back. So, so the comment relates to the New Yorker magazine and their uh, political cartoons, and they had some really good ones, uh, anti-Trump, which didn't have an impact on uh, the votes in New York. Yeah. Yes. Both parties use phone calls and doorbelling um, as a, a way to get people to talk about um, candidates and voting. How effective are those? So the question relates to uh, phone calls and doorbelling um, that the candidates use, and how effective is that in getting people out to vote and to, to supporting a candidate? And Michael, I think you have some statistics on that. Yeah. So um, there's actually there's a really good study by a couple of political scientists, Gerber and Green, um, who analyzed what um, what methods were best for getting voters um, out to the polls. Um, what they found was that phone calls didn't really do much of anything. Um, that, that postcards or, or mailers um, contributed a little bit um, to increase in the likelihood that somebody would turn out to vote, but the most effective way um, to get somebody to turn out to vote is to go and talk to them face to face. So, and, and that's still true today. So despite all of the different technological advances that we have created, the most effective way to this day to get somebody to come out and vote for you is to go up to their door and introduce yourself and talk to them. Gail. Uh, this campaign is criticized for its tone, for its argu argumentative fighting ongoing. Compare this campaign to Lincoln, to, I mean, Lincoln was called <laughs> being stupid, or, I mean, is it outrageous? So, Gail's question relates to the, uh, the tone of this campaign, and um, how does that compare with the past? And, and so I would say a couple of things. I would say, um, there are not good parallels to this campaign. Uh, certainly we have candidates who have said bad things about others, and we've talked about some of those uh, as we've gone through. But I think in terms of the, um, the viciousness of the comments that we hear in this campaign, it's unprecedented. Uh, we, we just have never seen anything like this in terms of the, the volume and the level and the other thing that I think makes this campaign different is the visibility of those comments, that we, uh, we hear them. We, we read it on Twitter or it's the front page of the paper or wherever, um, and, and so we're able to hear what's going on. And, and then maybe thirdly, it's because we've got uh, at least one candidate who has no filter, um, and, uh, and, and we, we've never seen anything quite like that. Yeah. Yes. So the question relates to um, 
how do women, how would they get the nomination and what, what are some of the, uh, the challenges? Yeah, so, um, so the study that I was talking about earlier, it said, you know, basically makes the argument that there are two reasons why women don't run as, as often as men. One was evaluations of their own qualifications. So men tend to be very, very confident in their own qualifications, whereas women were more questioning of their own qualifications as a result of a number of different um, societal factors. Um, the, other big, uh, the other big indicator was that um, parties didn't ask. And so a big part of who runs for office is dependent on parties going out and seeking candidates and saying, we want you to run for this open position, or we want you to run against this person. And what they found was that parties just didn't do that as often with women. And so those two things combined together, yeah, were, were, were big barriers. Yeah. Yes. So the question relates to the 1964 Daisy ad that only ran once, and uh, was it intentional that they only ran it once, or what was kind of the strategy behind that? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was intentional to only run it one time. It was a national airing. It aired um, on an NBC movie of the week. Um, and, yeah, and I'm not sure if they intended for, for more airings or not, or if they thought this is going to be so shocking that we only need to do it, we only need to do it once. So yeah, I'm not, that's a very interesting question. Yes. Okay, in my notes from about a month ago, March 24th, one of you said that many say Trump will be about 30 delegates short on the first ballot. Is that still something that is kind of predicted so the question relates to something that uh, either Michael or I said on March 24th um, that... Mike must have said it. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, Trump would be about 30 delegates short on the first ballot. And does that still hold true? Um, I, I don't know whether the 30 is right. I think at this point, um, as Michael was sharing earlier, that... Trump is well on his way to a first ballot victory. And um, I think that he is going to be um, close one way or the other. I mean, I don't think it's going to be overwhelmingly over that 1237. It might be a hair under. So one of the things you see in a lot of these projections are based on committed delegates, pledged delegates. So one of the wild cards out there relates to Pennsylvania. So there's 17 delegates that are awarded on a uh, statewide basis, um, and then 54 delegates that are uncommitted, and the de delegates can vote for whoever they want. So many of the delegates in Pennsylvania have said they will vote on the first ballot for whoever won the state. Well, that was Trump. So add into the projections of pledge delegates, you know, Another 25, 30 delegates, at least, from Pennsylvania. Um, I think Trump's going to be over. I, I mean, I think this uh, last set of primaries um, kind of changed the game. And, and I would, I think I would be surprised if Trump does not win a first ballot victory at this point. And Michael, do you have any other observations on that? No, other than I just I hope that it gets to a brokered convention. I was going to be really exciting. I know. It looked like it was going to happen for a long time. Yeah. And so we were going to have an event maybe with people here and watch it. And talk but it's going to be it. boring otherwise. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yes. What What is important to? What is important to me? I have not heard one candidate mention poverty rate of our children. In the city of Tacoma, we have 4,000 homeless children in the city of Tacoma. And nobody seems to be care. Mm -hmm. uh, my Social Security was cut by $580 this year, along with everyone's else. Mm -hmm. 
only people who make under $107,000 contribute to the Social Security system. So all of you who are dumb enough to vote to work for less than $107,000, you're supporting me. And it's not fair. Yeah. With, when you have $40 million a year football players, that when they get a concussion... That's not true. Yeah. It's not true? It's not true. Do you pay so, Social Security? So, so, so the, the, the comment first, and then the, the comment is um, that she hasn't heard candidates talk about poverty, um, po poverty issues for seniors, for uh, children, um, and that that hasn't been addressed a lot in the election. Um, so Bernie Sanders does talk a lot about that um, in, in terms of raising you know, the, the, the wages for people, so. Uh, so, so one, one of the things that, you know, we, when we talked about this early on, that when we look at candidates, there are really, or the, the election, there are really multiple issues that we ought to be paying attention to. One is we want to pay attention to um, what do the candidates believe about certain policy issues? I, and, and that's very important. But we also need to look at what is their capability to implement those changes. So it, it's, it's really easy to say certain things, and we have a number of candidates in this election who are saying a lot of things that resonate with people on both sides of the aisle. Um, but we have to ask the question, what's their capability to actually implement it? And then, and then we have to look deeper at the character of the candidates um, and, and just their tone and their ability to, to, to work within the system. So um, your, your question raises this issue because policy positions are important, but it's also really important that we uh, look at reality, too, I think. Yeah. Yes? They are not looking at any of that. Yes. And they seem to be an unusual group of people we haven't seen before. Yeah. So, so the comment is, is well taken comment that, you know, the things that I talked about that voters should look at, uh, these are things that many voters who are voting for Donald Trump are not paying attention to. Um, and, and so, I mean, we've got a very different uh, set of demographics in this country. Um, and, you know, you look at the statistics of who is voting for Donald Trump, um, big numbers of uneducated people. Now he's beginning to pick up more educated votes as well. But um, so people who respond to, um, you know, strong language, um, you know, the government's never done anything before, the system's broken, throw the rascals out. Um, and, and so there is a lot of this anger that, that people are responding to, which I, I don't think is a good way to, um, to, to vote, but, but it is a reality, I think. Yes? Perhaps the, the basis for that kind of anger is what she's talking about, is that they, may, or they, may, they don't have a person, they're unemployed and or underemployed. Right. And so I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the comment relates to some of the anger uh, comes out where people are not financially well off. And, and, and so they're, they're struggling and they're concerned about that. Yeah. Yes? Do you have any thoughts on uh, John Boehner's uh, comments? <laughs> <laughs> thoughts on John Boehner's comments? It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that that changes. I don't know that it changes very much uh, in the race. It's it's part of the problem in the race so far is that um, when members of the establishment come out and try to to make some sort of statement, um, that statement just becomes fuel for the candidates to say, "Look, you know, he was part of the establishment. Look how much he hates me. That's because I'm so anti-establishment." That, that I'm going to uh, really change things when I get in office. So I don't think it does anything um, but perhaps help um, 
Ted Cruz, but uh, it is certainly a fascinating moment in a campaign when you have you know, sort of an elder statesman of the, the party um, talking about one of the front runners in the presidential campaign in such uh, vivid terms. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we clearly have a big divide in the country. Um, and, you know, that's what's kind of coming out in some of this. Mark. In terms of influencing the election, on a one to ten scale, one nothing and ten yes everything, how influential do you think it, the series of debates will be on the, for the winner if it comes down to Clinton and Trump? So Mark's question relates to um, how influential will the presidential <clears throat> debates in the fall be if it's between uh, Clinton and Trump, um, and, and 10 being very influential and one not being influential at all. Um, I'll give my number and you, you give, give your, your number, yeah. Michael. Um, I, I think it's going to be very influential, um, and I'll give it an 8. <laughs> We're going to differ on this. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm about a 2, I think. <laughs> Which adds up to ten, which is good. So, the, I guess I'm I'm a I'm not much of a believer that debates in a general election matter that much. Um, I think that they get big audiences, but I don't think most of the people watching those debates are waiting to make up make up their mind. I think that we watch debates like we watch sporting events, and we're rooting for our favorite. Um, we're rooting for our favorite candidate, but it doesn't end up like shaping our opinions. You might see some change, um, you know, some minor, you know, ups and downs um, afterwards, but I think those are sort of temporary and things um, settle back down to right where they would be um, if the debates hadn't happened. Okay. Yes, Jack. So, uh, Cruz announced a running mate before... Uh, he did that. <laughs> no, I just said he did that, yeah. yeah. Before the convention before a nominee is settled, uh, which is pretty unusual, right? What's, what's his strategy? Is that, is that a ploy for attention? So Jack's question relates to, you know, why did Cruz announce a running mate at this point? Um, I mean, I think, that, I think that's exactly it. I mean, I, there's um, one of his former strategists was on TV today, and he said, um, basically, if you're doing nothing, you're losing. At this point, there's really, you know, there, it's it's a campaign that is very much in trouble. Um, do something big um, to get attention. Now, certainly, it would have been a much bigger deal if he were to get somebody like Marco Rubio to join the ticket, who actually had delegates um, to, to offer in the race. Um, I, I'm not sure that Carly Fiorina um, is... is a strategic choice that will get him that much um, in the long run, but I think that what it does is it sort of it, it put him on the front page of lots of papers today. I think she does have one delegate. Oh well, there you go. Very very influential. And if yes, it came right. down to one, that would be that would be an excellent decision. So yes. Well, I was just reacting. I was going to say I heard some people commenting that the, that it could have some impact on women's perception. Uh, yeah. Because of her background, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, but the, 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 strategic, the strategy behind it might have something to do with the women's vote. Yeah. So, yeah, the comment relates to does the selection of Carly, uh, is, is that a play for women voters? And, and yes, that could have an impact. Yeah, he actually, you know, was, was saying today on the campaign trail, Donald Trump has a problem with strong women. Um, and, and she was, you know, those were some of the, the most noted, uh, you know, most notable parts of her campaign when she would go sort of toe to toe with Trump uh, during debates. And so certainly that could be a potential reason that he selected her. Yeah. And it was about her that he made one of his more offensive comments. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. So let's take one more question. Would you comment on uh, Donald Trump's uh, foreign policy? <laughs> the question relates to would we comment on Donald Trump's foreign policy speech. Michael, do you want to? Uh, I'll have to admit to not watching the whole thing. Um, it was, I think, notable uh, in that he was clearly trying to uh, be a little bit more presidential and that he was reading it off of a um, teleprompter. Um, 
I think that, um, it, you know, it's an attempt to be more serious. It, it is a little bit confusing because he's presenting two visions of American foreign policy. On one hand, he is um, talking about how uh, we're weak and we're getting bullied um, and we need to stop that and be, you know, sort of more assertive. But on the other hand, he's saying that we're doing everything in the world and we need to step back and let others sort of take over. So one vision is this America that's sort of very weak and not involved and not not solving problems and the other is an America that's, you know, sort of involved in everything and needs to take sort of a back seat to other countries and so it's a little bit unclear what um, vision he has for America's involvement. Yeah. In and, and, and Donald Trump has never been accused of kind of having a good cohesive philosophy on things, and I think that's kind of what, yeah. what came out in that. Join us June 7th, and we'll figure out what's going to go on from there, and thank you for joining us tonight.